In the wake of the Trayvon Martin verdict in 2013, President Obama spoke of his experience as a black man. He recounted times when he was followed when shopping in a department store, when he heard the locks on Carter's click as he crossed the street, when he was in an elevator with a woman clutching her purse nervously and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. Philosophers like to ask big questions. Can we know anything? Is there a God? What is right or wrong? Likewise, philosophers thinking about race like to ask big questions. What is race? What is oppression? Should we strive for a colorblind society? Our philosophical thinking about race and social justice tends to focus on large-scale social change, on policies like affirmative action. Yet we rarely reflect on, on interactions like those described by President Obama. These are the very interactions that get in the way of large-scale social change. My approach is distinctive in that I focus on the micro level, on the level of day-to-day -day interactions. In my research, I pour over descriptions of personal experience, both from mainstream media and those already integrated in philosophical texts. Imagine that you're in circumstances like President Obama's. You feel the presence of the security personnel. You hear the locks click. You sense the woman clutching her purse. There's a high level of discomfort here, a physical reality to these experiences. I analyze these and similar experiences using the concept of bodily alienation. And here's what I have in mind. When we perform everyday tasks, we, our body's movements tend to recede from awareness. For example, when I'm biking, I don't need to focus on when to push each pedal. These movements have become second nature. However, under oppressive circumstances, we tend to internalize the gaze, the presence of others, and this can paralyze us. Now, a lot has been written about bodily alienation, about the structure of these breakdown cases. But comparatively little has been written about what we can do about situations like President Obama's. How can we change these types of situations? I adopted the concept of embodied resistance in order to make sense of our positive efforts. Embodied resistance has been used by sociologists and anthropologists to describe the activism of members of oppressed groups. However, in my research, I apply embodied resistance to activism of members of both oppressed and non-oppressed groups in order to emphasize the continuity between them. I regard embodied resistance as the result of our efforts to mutually understand each other, to negotiate internal resistances, and to connect with others. Let's return to the elevator scenario. Instead of putting yourself in President Obama's shoes, imagine now that you're the woman clutching your purse. How could you change the situation? Well, you might decide to smile or even touch the man, but this is likely to disturb him, to reinforce the sense of otherness members of oppressed groups already have. So how could you adopt a sensitive gesture. Well, here's where we can draw on a long, primarily Eastern philosophical tradition of thinking about the breath. Instead of reflexively clutching your purse or overriding your reflexes, you might breathe and relax and be able to respond in a more natural manner. You might smile or nod or even start a conversation. Think about how changes like these could snowball into larger ones. My point is this. We can perpetuate oppressive climates, or we can contribute to ending them, depending on how we use our bodies. My work consists in spelling out how we can use our bodies in positive ways. We're embodied beings, and resisting oppression begins with the body. Thank you.